that, I'd like to welcome Sean Thompson to the stage. So, uh, for a long time, uh, I, was a, I was a pro surfer. I'm now an amateur storyteller. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I do. So, I wanted to talk to you today about a couple of things. One is a, a code, and one is a, about how to use this concept of a code to create a good way. So, back in the, uh, in the early 70s, while I was in the Pro 2, I was also uh, studying at, uh, at university. I was studying um, the philosophy of management. And I came across this uh, tremendous uh, philosopher, a guy called Peter Drucker. And uh, if any of you have heard of Peter Drucker, he's one of the great thinkers of the uh, 20th century. And he said that any organization uh, has to ask five fundamental questions of itself. And the first question being, what's your mission? So we have 300 people here, we have 100 organizations, and I bet if everyone stands up, there's gonna be 100 different missions. But when I read and hear about everyone's purpose here, we all have one mission. We have the same mission, and that's to serve the sea. That's what we are all here for. That's what I'm here for. That's what I've been doing since I first stood up on a wave in 1966. And I've got to tell you how stoked I am to be in this crowd with everyone and having that same mission, all of us, to serve the sea. So I want to talk to you a little bit about my background just to contextualize my journey. So that's my mom and dad. I grew up on the beach in Durban, South Africa. My mom was a survivor. She endured 4,500 air raids in the most heavy bomb place in the history of the world in Malta. Eventually was evacuated down to South Africa. My father was a swimming champion, loved the beach, was uh, destined to go along to the Olympics. Just before he was going to go to the Olympics, he was lying on his little surfboard, having a wave, and those are his words, I was lifted clear from the water. The Zambezi shark came up underneath him, and in one bite, then he ripped his arm off and destroyed his swimming career. But my memories are, my earliest memories of my dad taking me down the beach and teaching me how to swim where the shark had nearly bitten his arm off. There was no bitterness associated with this terrible tragedy that, that befell him. And when my dad went to recuperate, luckily he came from a relatively affluent um, family, he was sent to San Francisco right here for arm surgery and then recuperated on the island of Oahu and he fell in with the Jew and his family. And for us, Duke Kahanamoku had been my father's swimming hero, and Duke ultimately became my hero, and my dream was to go to Hawaii. My dad took me to Hawaii for the first time uh, when I was 13 for my bar mitzvah, and I fell in love with the Hawaiian heritage and culture, and it's so amazing to see the boards here. And I met a couple of guys uh, from Hawaii yesterday, so Hawaii's always been part of my blood. I started uh, doing well as a surfer relatively young, uh, I came third in my very first surfing contest. There was only three of us. <laughs> but I got the third. Uh, I, I won my first event at 17 years old, a big event in, uh, in South Africa, and gave me enough money to go and compete in, in Hawaii. I ultimately won the, the Papa Masters. I was the youngest guy to win the Masters, and then won the World Surfing Championship. And you know, back then, little shorts, lots of girls. It was a really, it was a really fun life. <laughs> I started my first company in, uh, in uh, 1979 called Instinct, which grew into quite a popular co company. We, we were in 13 countries, and uh, uh, we had the distinction for a while being one of the largest employers in a small, small African country. Um, and I called it Instinct because the best moments in surfing happen when you're inside the tube, and the best tubes happen when you're operating uh, on Instinct. I sold the company when I retired from the tour in, uh, in, in 1990. And my wife and I, my beautiful wife Carla, we've been married for over 30 years, uh, moved over with, with my wonderful son uh, Matthew to the United States in 1995 and we settled in Santa Barbara. Um, I worked for the wonderful company Patagonia for two years when we decided to strategize how to uh, connect with uh, the surfing market. I was uh, a good friend of Yvon Chenard and he was a guy that taught me so much about, uh, about how doing the right thing can be uh, great for business. Uh, I worked for um, O'Neill for a few years, and ultimately my wife and I started our, um, a, a company called uh, Solitude, which uh, we, we ultimately sold to um, a publicly traded corporation after about eight years in business. So I've tried to combine both the physicality of surfing as a pro, business, 
aspect of surfing. And also, uh, that's a shot of me with uh, Jack and Neil. I was, I was the first guy to be sponsored by, um, uh, by Neil back in, the, back in the day. I have great memories of Jack and Pat and the family. I made a film uh, a number of years ago, some of you guys might have seen it, called um, Busting Down the Door. It was quite a popular movie about uh, what one had to do in order to be successful. Uh, in Hawaii, it told a great story about uh, uh, a clash, uh, an accidental clash that ultimately created uh, pro surfing. So regarding environmentalism and our mission to serve the sea, uh, in 1984, I got a call from a guy, his name was Glenn Henning. He said, Sean, I'm starting, along with a couple of other guys, and I met one of the other founders. Stand up. One of the other founders, the third other founders. He said, I'm starting this uh, environmental organization. It's going to be called Surfrider. We're having a severe environmental challenge in Malibu. I want you to be our first member and ambassador. I said, great. And he said, I want you to appear in an ad. I said, cool, I'm going to write the copy. Do a good turn today. And in 1984, I joined Surfrider and I've been on the board a few times and, and I love what we're doing. Today we have, what, 60,000 members around the world. We have uh, uh, about 60 chapters and um, the mission is so, so uh, simple. So about 10 years later, Glenn Hing phoned me up again. He said, Sean, Rincon, your favorite break, your adopted homeland, your adopted home break, is also facing, facing a severe environmental challenge. All the homeowners are connected up to septic tanks. When it rains, the septic spill up and the crack blows out in the creek and all the surface gets sick. He said, I want you to help me solve the problem. I said, sure, well, what, what can I do? He said, I've got a hundred bucks. A <laughs> hundred bucks. He said, that's your budget. I said, a hundred bucks? He said, I'm bringing a group of kids down to the beach, and I want you to give them something so they're going to be environmentally aware. He said, you're going to bring a group of about a hundred kids down to the beach, you're going to bring the media down there, and we're going to create a sense of urgency, and we want to activate the environmental consciousness of these young people. And you've got a hundred bucks to do it. So I'm like, like, what can I do for a hundred bucks? So I go home, and I put out a sheet of paper, and I write 12 lines. Every line beginning with, I will. And I wrote it in 30 minutes, and I printed up a little card, and I called it Surface Code. And those lines can be interpreted in multiply different ways. They're just a metaphor for life, for courage, for camaraderie, for commitment, for honor, for integrity, for service, for purpose, for telos purpose, for ethos, for character. And I printed 100 cards up. Cost me. 100 bucks. <laughs> and I came in on budget. You know, management, I was saving management. <laughs> and I gave them out to the kids that came down to the beach uh, the following week, and it turned into a groundswell. Glenn actually started another organization called Groundswell. The kids liked the cards, the media thought it was interesting. We activated the consciousness. Ultimately, another environmental group got formed, and then over a period of years, the problem was solved. But this little card changed my life and turned into something way bigger than myself because out of the card came a book and we printed thousands and ten thousands and then hundreds of thousands of these cards because we used to put them in our clothing solitude and we were making quite a few clothes uh, at the time and out of it came a book and the book became popular and then I was sitting out at Rincon on another day and a guy paddles up to me and he said Sean I'm a headmaster of a local school he said my name's Gordon Sitchi I'd like you to come and talk at my school so I took the book and I took the code and I went down and spoke at this little school called Anna Kappa School in Santa Barbara. And I said to the kids, Surface Code is my code. And I carry it around with me in my wallet all the time to remind me of what I wrote, to remind myself of my mission. And I carry it around with me every day and I hand, you know, hand it out hundreds of thousands of these cards. And when I spoke to the kids, I said, Surface Code is my code. Write your code. Write and tell me what you will do. I will. 12 lines, write in 30 minutes. So the kids wrote me their code, and they sent it to me. And the very first line of code I got back from this young girl, Elena Sarah, who got a free ride to Berkeley this year, I will always be myself. How is that word? I will always, always be myself. It's like an anthem, an anthem for you, because everyone here that's a parent knows the shit that our children are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I read those words and I cried. I'll be myself. Some of you know my story of what happened to my boy. I lost my boy. 
So those words would particularly resonate to me. And all the other wonderful words, I will try to be nice to others. I, I will have fun. I will not compromise on my morals to fit in with others. So I got so inspired by this, I read another book. And every single chapter was written by a child. I'll be myself. I'll dream. I'll face my fears. All the way down to I'll share my story. So the book became popular. I was stoked. I saw it was Amazon number one in the teen section. Only for a few seconds, but I'll claim it. <laughs> <laughs> but I get these particularly poignant messages from young people. Now look at this one. Hi, Sean. My name's Garrison. I met you tonight at Fly Hill Mall, and your words just resonated with me. I knew it was a surfer, because only surfers still resonated with me. <laughs> But the last line, I will live another day. I mean, I'll live another day. How cool is that? So now I go around to schools around the country, and kids will create graphics. They'll create, they'll do art exhibitions. They'll, they'll make product. I will be unique. I will not let negativity bring me down. I'll be different. These are kids in South Africa. I'll focus on my future. I'll be a positive buyer. I went back to grad school to, uh, to do a master's a few years back because I was fascinated about influence. How can one inspire and influence others for a common good. How can one create a good one that is going to flow through society? So I came across some of these tragic studies. 20,000 young kids, more than half of young kids that die in the United States are from poor choice. One million Americans out of the 2.4 million Americans that die every year die from poor choice. It's the single biggest killer in our country. Kids die from a number of reasons. They die from lack of hope. They die from despair. A lot of you might be familiar with the different studies on the ripple effect. How all of us have incredible power to create a drop in an ocean, and that ripple can flow out into emotional contagion, can influence people in a positive or negative direction. People are walking mood inductors, continually, continuously influencing the moods and then the judgments and behaviors of others. I came across this study. This is a fundamental study why the election was lost, and you never read about this study. This was the biggest social study in the history of the world. 689,000 people were studied without knowing by Facebook and the National Academy of Sciences. And they proved massive scale emotional contagion through social networks. By what we write and say and do, we can influence the behaviors of others without them knowing. So I thought, wow, man, what about using this information to create a positive wave across the nation. So I thought, is it possible to create a wave that's not generated by wind on water? And a mate of mine called Kelly Slade gave me an idea. Protection here. The technology from Kelly Slater's Wave Company, all the engineers on hand to celebrate this historical day, the future classic. So that's me on my first wave in front of the 16 best surfers in the world. I haven't gone left for two years. <laughs> Waves appeared out of this flat sea and it was perfect. And I didn't cry, but it was like this duplication of nature, but in a different way opened up a whole new horizon for surfing as a sport, surfing as a lifestyle, for surfing as a, a family fun. It was incredible. So that was really cool. This was even cooler. Surf Ranch, approximate cap cost about 30 million bucks. I calculated that if every surfer goes out and rides 10 waves, gets a good 10 sessions, you can, can only accommodate 9,000 surfers a year. 9,000 surfers. I'm going, man, I believe I can create a positive wave a lot cheaper and impact at least 40,000 people. So the goal is to now attempt to create a positive wave across the nation by getting students to inspire each other. So I hook up with the biggest insurance company in South Africa, I'm still quite well known, and I hook up with a publisher and I say, listen, we're going to publish a book and we're going to go to schools. We're going to create a positive wave across the nation by telling some stories, by getting kids to create a code, and getting kids to share the code with the social universe. So 
So last year I graded 24,000, uh, 24 schools, 40,000 students. And I know there's some post-colonials here in the audience, New Zealanders, English, the poshest, you guys know what posh means, and the poorest, that was the goal, to go to the poshest schools and the poorest schools. We printed hundreds of thousands of these badges with our will on it and live the code. That live the code came from, from, from Sean White. Um, and I started going to school. I'm a white dude going to these black schools in South Africa that even though they're not stratified by apartheid, they're stratified by economics. I go to this school in Kaplahong near Johannesburg, and this is what happens. Sir for Sean Thompson is one of South Africa's finest sporting heroes. Famous for his style of riding the tube section of the wave, Thompson won the International Professional Surfers World Championship in 1977. Considered one of the ten greatest surfers of all time, he now inspires others to follow his paddle. In this underprivileged school in Katahong on the east side of Johannesburg, Thompson shares with youngsters a simple strategy for confronting everyday challenges and making positive, life-changing decisions. So wonderful to be inspiring some young kid in Johannesburg or Durban or, or Los Angeles. Anyway, just to know that you drop the little pedal in the water and once it does, it's good in a way. And that way it's going to go and touch love. In 12 personal stories, Sean shares the power of I will, a code that carries him through life. Well, yes, this little code that I wrote, 12 lines that I wrote so many years ago, was about surfing. It's like every line is a metaphor. It can be interpreted in so many different ways. It's about how you can be a good person, how you can be a good human being, how you can make a difference in the world how you can impact others. So I've been on this journey for 10 years now, since I lost my beautiful son. And surfing was this constant. Surfing helped get me back on the path to healing again. Many of these teenagers have barely seen a beach, but the code has resonated among them. I will achieve my goals. I will be better. I will dream big, and I will be who I want to be. I will arise and shine, and I will face my fears, and I will take charge of my life. Although all these youngsters were born after apartheid, many of them are still trapped by poverty. But the code is giving them courage to change their lives. In this country, I deprived right of opportunities, and I will break that cycle of being deprived of opportunities, and I will create opportunity for myself. This book will give me the courage that I don't have. It, I think it will give me that power to do what I want to do and to believe in myself. Sean Thompson's The Code is about many things. Faith, courage, creativity, determination. But above all, it's about promises we make to ourselves, about the future and to turn hope into action. Judy Shar, CGTN, Katahong, South Africa. <laughs> so, like you, as a servant of the sea, we all have this great power. And I wanted to tell you that story about how I dropped that little stone and it turned into a wave, and we can all do that in our organizations, in our families, in our communities. So, thank you.